Hi, today I am joined by School for the Dogs apprentice, Leah Weissman, who is going to talk about two very important behaviors that we teach all the time at School for the Dogs, find it and touch. Leah has been doing reels for our Instagram. You can see them at School for the Dogs on Instagram. You can also find Leah on Instagram at G-A-L Dog Training. That stands for George and Leah Dog Training. George is her pup. I tried to schedule this call with Leah at a time when my infant daughter would be napping, but I was foiled. <laughs> so you can hear her uh, goo goo gaga -ing a little bit during this talk. And uh, I apologize for that, but as a working mother, sometimes I just have to not allow the perfect to be the enemy of the good, as they say. Before I share this conversation with you, however, I wanted to do a little bit of time travel back to a world before the dog whisperer was ever on TV and Caesar Milan was not a household name. I just came across a fantastic episode of a YouTube channel called Illuminati. It's also a podcast. It's spelled I-L-L-U-M-I-N-A-U-G-H-T-I-I. -I. And uh, this episode is just a really excellent summary of the controversy Around Caesar, Milan does an interesting job of presenting various sides and is sort of refreshing in that it's rare uh, to read about Caesar Milan in um, forums, at least for me, <laughs> in any forum that isn't run by dog trainers uh, who all have their own opinions. Uh, this person is someone who... Um, is uh, a non-dog trainer who really seems to get what um, what so many dog trainers are upset about when it comes to uh, the dog whisperer and she pointed to this letter that I had never seen which I uh, found super interesting and I'd like to share it was written by Dr. Andrew Luescher uh, and he is a veterinary behaviorist uh, at Purdue University. He was consulted by National Geographic before the show aired. Uh, they wanted his opinion on the show, and um, apparently this is what he wrote to them. I reviewed the four preview videotapes kindly submitted to me by National Geographic. I very much appreciate having gotten the opportunity to see these tapes before the program goes on the air. I will be happy to review any programs that deal with domestic animal behavior and training. I believe this is a responsibility of our profession. I have been involved in continuing education for dog trainers for over 10 years, first through the How Dogs Learn program at the University of Guelph, Ontario Veterinary College, and then through the Dogs course at Purdue University. I therefore know very well where dog training stands today, and I must tell you that Milan's techniques are outdated and unacceptable not only to the veterinary community but also to dog trainers. The first question regarding the above mentioned tapes I have is this. The show repeatedly cautions the viewers not to attempt these techniques at home. What then is the purpose of this show? I think we have to be realistic. People will try these techniques at home, much to the deterrent of their pets. Milan's techniques are almost exclusively based on two techniques, flooding and positive punishment. In flooding, an animal is exposed to a fear or aggression evoking stimulus and prevented from leaving the situation until it stops reacting. To take a human example, arachnophobia would be treated by locking a person into a closet, releasing hundreds of spiders into that closet, and keeping the door shut until the person stops reacting. The person might be cured by that, but also might be severely disturbed and would have gone through an excessive amount of stress. Flooding has therefore always been considered a risky and cruel method of treatment. 
Positive punishment refers to applying an aversive stimulus or correction as a consequence of a behavior. There are many concerns about punishment aside from its unpleasantness. Punishment is entirely inappropriate for most types of aggression and for any behavior that involves anxiety. Punishment can suppress most behavior, but does not resolve the underlying problem, i.e. the fear or anxiety. Even in cases where correctly applied punishment might be considered appropriate, many conditions have to be met that most dog owners can't meet. The punishment has to be applied every time the behavior is displayed, within half a second of the behavior, and at the correct intensity. I would just like to point out three particularly disturbing episodes. In one, a Great Dane is dragged onto a slippery floor by a choke chain. Again, punishment and flooding is used. The dog was under extreme stress. The photographer did an excellent job at documenting the excessive drooling. In another sequence, a vishla is corrected for f showing fear by inflicting pain. Would you hit your frightened child if it was afraid, say, of heights? The most disturbing sequence was the Entelbuscher mountain dog with compulsive disorder that was quote-unquote treated with a prong collar. The dog's behavior could be compared to stereotypic rocking in a child. The method Milan used to approach this problem would be like hitting the severely disturbed child each time it rocks. I bet you could suppress rocking behavior, but certainly no one would suggest that that child was cured. The last episode, compulsive disorder, is particularly unsettling because compulsive disorder is related to an imbalance in neurotransmitter levels or receptors and is therefore unequivocally a medical condition. Would it be appropriate to treat obsessive compulsive disorder in people with punishment or have a layperson go around treating such patients? Most of the theoretical explanations that Milan gives regarding causes of the behavior problems are wrong. Not one of these dogs had an issue with dominance. Not one of these dogs wanted to control their owners. What he was right about was that calmness and consistency are, consistency are extremely important, but they don't make the presented methods appropriate or justifiable. The title, The Dog Whisperer, is particularly ironic. The title is, of course, taken from The Horse Whisperer. The training techniques of The Horse Whisperer are based on an understanding of equine behavior and are non-confrontational and particularly gentle. Caesar Milan, anything but whispers. I think this series, if aired, would be a major embarrassment for National Geographic. It is not stimulating or thought-provoking since none of the pre presented techniques are new. They are outdated and have long been abandoned by most responsible trainers, let alone behaviorists, in, as inappropriate and cruel. I very much hope National Geographic will pull the plug on this program. My colleagues and I and innumerable leaders in the dog training community have worked now for decades to eliminate such cruel, ineffective, in terms of true cure, and inappropriate techniques. It would be a major blow for all our efforts if National Geographic portray portrayed these very techniques as the current standard in training and behavior modification. National Geographic would be in a difficult situation because they would promote an individual practicing veterinary medicine without a license, at least compulsive disorder as a medical condition, and the diagnosis of any behavior problem is considered practicing veterinary medicine in the Model Veterinary Practice Act. I also would not be surprised if the large national animal welfare organizations were to sue National Geographic for promoting cruelty to animals. I can guarantee to you that they would have the support of all professional organizations involved in dog behavior and training. Signed, Andrew Luescher, DVM, PhD, DACVB, Director, Animal Behavior Clinic, School of Veterinary Medicine, Purdue University, again, this was sent to National Geographic before the show ever aired, and unfortunately, the show aired nevertheless. My name is Annie Grossman, and I'm a dog trainer. I'm the owner and co-founder of School for the Dogs, a dog training center located in Manhattan's East Village. the dogs for the dogs school school for the dogs for the dogs on this podcast i talk about dog training interview industry experts discuss pet trends answer questions and try to communicate my love for all things related to behavioral science thanks a lot for listening i think this podcast will help make you the best possible human best friend 
any dog could ask for. Uh, hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Oh my gosh. Poppy, come here, sweetie. Go to your crate. Are you the goodest girl? Oh, what a good girl. You're such a sweetie. Yesterday we had a handyman here. This guy was come before. Poppy was, you know, first she was like barking at him and I sat and, uh, I mean, it was of course a little bit of madness and I like had the baby tied to me, but like I sat and did a little bit of just like cooking her for looking at him and mm -hmm. relaxation mat stuff. And, you know, by the time he was leaving, like she was jumping on him and I mean, in, in like a, like happy way. At yeah. Least. Like it, but of, I mean, of course, like I've been trying to work on her jumping, but you know, if she's like jumping, if she's like happy jumping on this yes. guy that she otherwise would have been scared of, I'm going to take it. And he yes. just like seemed fine with it. And then right before he left, I cued her to go to her bed and she went right to her bed and he was like, she's, she's such a well-trained dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I love you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for saying that after my dog just just barked at you and then jumped on you. Yeah. And it was like it was like, you know, it both just showed sort of what a empathetic person he was, but yeah. also maybe how um how uh low people's expectations are. So low. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Basically. But also, I mean, nice that he wasn't like, you know. God, here's this dog trainer with a dog who barks at me and jumps on me. Like, <laughs> yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm drinking coffee. I was just curious how the Milena talk was on Wednesday. It was amazing. Not only did we talk about like the separation anxiety stuff, but there was like this story that kind of touched me. And it was, have you heard of like the starfish story? I'm going to probably not tell it very well but it's like a bunch of starfish are washed up on the shore and like an old man is standing on the shore uh and a another person comes walking down and sees the old man tossing this like one starfish at a time back into the ocean and the person coming along was like old man why are you doing that there's like thousands and thousands of starfish all all up and down the beach like you can't help them all and the old man was like, well, the tide is coming and I'm sure it matters to like these one, one starfish or that starfish. Or... And I was like kind of comparing it to burnout and like feeling like you're not able to help every dog and human out there, which like obviously starting out as a dog trainer, I'm like feeling a lot, but that like even with what we can do and if we're concentrating on, you know, one person and one dog at a time. And we're still making a big difference, especially to that person and that dog. One dog at a time. Yeah. I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk about touch and find it because you did this lovely reel on Instagram uh, about how those are sort of the two, uh, two of the most important cues to teach. And I thought maybe I could ask you uh, why you thought that. Yeah, totally. Start with whichever you please. Well, find it is one that I think not a lot of people even really know. I mean, a lot of people probably know about it, but maybe not why it's so awesome. So how can, can you describe what find it is? Yes. Find it is basically giving your dog a cue to put their nose to the ground and sniff and look for uh, like a treat or a reward or something. And it can be like the basis of it's it's technically a nose work game well wait, what does find it look like if you're just watching someone do find it the person dropping a treat and then the dog sniffing and going and finding it um and before the person tosses this treat uh they're giving the cue like so they're just saying find it and then literally grabbing a treat and tossing it on the ground close to their dog at first to kind of make it easy and then you can start building it up to you know be further away or hidden so find it in this very easy way becomes a cue for hey throw your your nose to the ground something good's gonna be there yes exactly it's almost like saying catch yeah like if you totally. say catch to someone you're getting their like arms up yeah and um like they're ready to receive focused on you and what's coming at them totally 
find it is uh it's so great because it's so easy <laughs> right it's like all you like you throw treats on the ground there's not even any criterion for your dog like the dog yeah yeah i like using i like doing find it with like nice like crunchy treats that are gonna like make a sound on the ground at first too to kind of help totally find it yes um, and eventually doing it in like grass is great yeah using it like as a dog dog play break so mm -hmm. if they're okay with having food around both of them and kind of like tossing treats in opposite directions in the grass and getting mm -hmm. them to forcibly sort of break from play and disengage and lower arousal that way totally totally and it's so um like what a natural thing we're asking them to do go find go find something with your nose this powerful yeah. nose that you have and go find something that you like yes the <coughs> nose is so amazing poppy go to your crate you know i'm telling her to go to her crate actually it, it strikes me that go to your crate it's sort of a iteration of find it because it's like go find something in this very specific spot mm -hmm. and i do it with sort of the same classical conditioning approach with her where it's like the treats are happening in her crate whether or not she's coming there yes um most of the time so she just knows to run there to get her at yums so the other behavior that you talked about in this nice uh real was touch, um, which I have talked about on the podcast before, but I'd be interested to know how you would describe touch and why it's an important behavior. Because I'll, again, it's a behavior that I think many people would not think to necessarily teach their dog first. Like people mm -hmm. think of, you know, sit and down, stay. Yes. And those are all really functional and so is touch. So first, I guess I'll say how versatile it is and kind of what you can build off of it. And in the end, you could have behaviors like for cooperative care. You could have long distance recalls um, starting with just presenting your hand in this basic behavior that you're getting your dog to boop their nose to your hand at first. Um, cooperative care being behaviors that we can work on to help dogs do things that can help us take care of them whether that's gro grooming husbandry etc exactly because if you you could start out with so it's just basically the the nose area of their face <laughs> touching your the palm of your hand or two fingers outstretched or something simple like that um but it's very easy after getting that behavior really solid as a basis to use that for all of these other training behaviors um like a chin rest which is very similar it's just kind of like a different positioning of your hand on a different place on their face and then you know using targeting to you could use targeting for other parts of their body as well so like teaching them to target their paw to um, like a bell on the door it's just super versatile what are some things that you have taught uh george using a hand touch um, like a chin rest. So the chin rest that I used um, off of the touch behavior, now I can, you know, I eventually used it to be able to um, have his head resting and putting the toothbrush close to his mouth and then eventually, you know, actually brushing his entire teeth using the chin rest um, stationary behavior for him. I've taught him to start going around my body with basically luring without using a, a treat. So I'm using my hand as a lure since he knows such a good recall to it. So he'll always kind of work towards going and moving his body and his face towards my hand if it's outstretched and I tell him to touch. And so you can use that to basically lure him into positions without having to use food. Well, how about walking? Yeah. If you can get them to follow your hand and start to have their face, which is their whole body, is connected to their face in a position next to you where you can have your hand outstretched. Um, so you can basically have your hand outstretched next to your knee and be walking and have your dog be hand targeting with their face to your hand. Uh, that way they're kind of like in that magic zone walking position next to you, um, which can be, you know, 
more or less around your heel area, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a strict heel position. I think that teaching touch is also a good way to get people to not be so reliant on waving food around in front of their dog's faces, instead uh, using their hand as a way to lure the dog if they're in the habit of luring and getting them used to separating the behavior from the food reward if you're using a food reward using a clicker or some other marker to pinpoint the moment of the touch. Because I think a lot of people think that reward-based training means waving food around in your dog's face forever. Yeah, I, I think that's a very common misconception is that you have to have, I think that is one of the biggest common misconceptions is that, you know, you always have to have food in front of your dog. And I think that's also the biggest mistake is continuing maybe in the beginning, um, you know, when they're just learning something or they're just learning how to do training in general. When you're doing, um, when you're like starting with more sort of just classical conditioning, like, Hey, I want you to feel good about the world. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, but then like teaching concepts and like complex behaviors and things like that you definitely want to fade the food into the background so it's not present and it's kind of brought out after the fact that way it's always a you know reward for their behavior as opposed to you know a bribe or something like that um all right well I think we touched on we touched on find it we touched on touch oh what I was going to say before about find it is Kate recently said to me, like, I'm starting to think, like, the answer to so many dog training problems is just, just to throw food on the floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's good. Kate, who's, like, one of the best dog trainers I know. Yeah. I was like, yeah, 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 that sounds Be- right. Behavior trainers, too. Behavior but... trainer, right? And here we yeah. are. Here, here, um, like, how, how simple can we get it? And yet, like, there's so much static out there. There's so much. Um, yep. <clears throat> you know, hold the leash in this specific way. Put your hands here, not there. Da, 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 da. Yeah. <sighs> well, Leah, it's good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. And um, and uh, oh my God, you're almost done with our first round of the virtual apprenticeship. Oh my God, I know. I'm so excited. <laughs> and it was great talking to you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um. Well, maybe um, we will have you on again when we open up the next round of the apprenticeship to um, answer questions about it to other yes. people who might be interested in doing that. Yes, it's um, amazing, and I'm excited to do that. But I think we should hold off on that until I have a sign-up page even, which I don't. But <laughs> he's listening and would like to join the School for Dogs next round of our virtual apprenticeship. Um, I guess just probably best thing is to email me at annie at schoolforthedogs.com and I will talk um, to you soon. Thanks so much, Leah. Thank you, Annie. Bye. School, school for the dogs. For the Thank dogs. you so much for listening. And special school, thanks to Bill and Lizzie of Toast Garden for the amazing the theme song. You can find dogs. Toast Garden at youtube.com slash toastgarden. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a review on iTunes. You can also support us by shopping at storeforthedogs.com. And you can learn more about us at schoolforthedogs.com. You can also connect with other listeners by downloading our brand new app. Just visit schoolforthedogs.com slash community.